Hello everybody, and welcome back to part two of the review of World's Worst Warships. So we've broken the back of the pre-Dreadnought era and World War I, and we're now on to interwar and World War II ships. As we said at the end of the last video, we're going to start with the next entry, HMS Hood. And on this one it will probably come as a little surprise to many of you that I thoroughly disagree with this ship's inclusion, and once again, somewhat bizarrely, it would appear here that so does Mr. Preston, at least and as far as he doesn't actually make an argument as to why Hood is a terrible warship. Um, in either the summary of the ship's history or in his conclusion, he appears to be mostly complaining about the fact that the ship was sent in to fight the Bismarck unmodernized, which is a fair point, and I thoroughly agree with that. So is somehow included on a list of world's worst warships because it was sent to fight a modern a relatively modern warship whilst unmodernized and it exploded that doesn't really in my book make it count as a bad warship in fact as he points out in the beginning of his summary of hood's history at the time of its launch it was actually a very capable warship by the standards of the day um, it had a few flaws in Things like its distributed armor scheme as opposed to an all or nothing armor scheme, but again, outside of the United States, not uncommon for the period. So, if anything, this is a good example of why, as the Admiralty, they should have put Hood in for a refit in the 1930s, a la the uh, War Spite, Queen Elizabeth Valiant, etc., etc., or HMS Renown, even. Um, Yes, so, so yeah, Hood was yes, Hood was in terrible condition at the time of its fight, and that probably didn't help with its loss. But as a warship, Hood it was a victim of circumstance and incredibly lucky shooting, not the fact that it's one of the world's worst warships, not by a long shot. Next up are the Omaha class cruisers. These are a bunch of fast scout cruisers built by the US Navy in the immediate aftermath of World War One and well started during World War One to be perfectly honest. Um and well, as the first vaguely modern cruiser type that the US Navy inherited or was had built for it, it's possibly not a great surprise that they weren't tremendously good warships all told. They were very fast, which is what they were designed for. Um but as his article points out, the there were cruisers that weighed several thousand tons less that had more firepower than them. And their armour, well, it was pretty much proof against destroyers. And that's really about it. Um, ironically enough, uh, they ended up being used more and being more useful as destroyer flotilla leaders than cruisers. So as scout cruisers for the role that they were designed for, taking on the enemy fleet, yeah, they, they, they weren't at all really all that much. They, yes, they were fast, but when you're scouting up against enemy forces that are going to include their own light cruisers as well as battle cruisers, they're basically XP pinatas for the enemy fleet. In their use elsewhere, I mean, obviously, once again, you have to apply the caveat that by the time of World War II, they were fairly old ships, but they didn't see a tremendous amount of combat nor any tremendous success in that for that matter, albeit that they did manage to have the rather nice accolade of not losing any of themselves to enemy attack, which is nice, although a few of them were damaged. The main reason that I would move these from sort of maybe substandard or kind of an experiment that didn't work out over it to not right at the bottom, but probably n nearer the upper end of uh, a list of worst warships is as is pointed out, the fact that actually by the time they were practically ready to go and in service, their weight on them was such that many of their guns weren't actually usable in uh, Seaway. So, yeah, it's a bad design feature on a Dreadnought battleship when some of your uh, six-inch guns can't be used because they keep getting washed out even in a moderate sea. When that's happening to a cruiser and it's your primary weaponry that's suffering that fate, yeah. So, yeah, I 
I kind of agree in as much as I would class the Omaha's as probably the weakest um, design of all the modern US Navy cruisers. And that's not just by pure firepower, but in terms of actual design practicality. But I, so yeah, I can see why they're on the list. I kind of agree with it, but I do obviously bear in mind that they were a kind of an experimental type of cruiser designed for a fleet that never really came into being albeit that the fleet that it was designed for also included the lexingtons as battle cruisers which well probably actually far more worthy of inclusion on this list as uh, terrible designs then we have uh, his majesty's swedish ship gotland the uh, hybrid seaplane carrier dash light cruiser of the swedish navy uh, laid down and launched and commissioned in the 1930s uh, had a small claim to fame in being one of the first ships to spot the Bismarck along with its little air contingent. Now most of the criticisms made of this ship are involved in the book are that effectively it wasn't a particularly good seaplane carrier given that it was designed for 11 and generally only ever carried six um, and that the seaplanes were vulnerable to damage in rough seas, and that with only six six-inch guns and two of those not having particularly great firing arcs, it wasn't a particularly brilliant light cruiser either. And I can see those criticisms. And yes, a hybrid aircraft carrying war gun warship is never a particularly fantastic idea. However, again, he kind of, within his own argument, he points out that the Swedes had to go with what they could afford. Now, if Gotland had been built in the 1930s by one of the major navies, um, America, Britain, Japan, even Germany or Italy, then yes, I would say if one of those navies had come up with this design concept, it probably would deserve a, a spot on this list because of they know better and they can afford better however when we're looking at the people who actually had to build it as i said the swedes had financial constraints and ultimately what else could they have done they needed to be able to scout so by the 1930s that means aircraft can sweden afford an aircraft carrier does it know how to operate an aircraft carrier or even a full full through seaplane carrier no it can't um <laughs> uh they have no idea what on earth they'd be doing with an aircraft carrier, and an aircraft carrier or, sea or full-length seaplane carrier would be hideously vulnerable to practically anything that could shoot, including like destroyers and torpedo boats. At least with its guns, yeah, okay, maybe it can't take on a full-scale light or heavy cruiser, but it can certainly see off destroyers. It can. It's got a decent anti-aircraft battery for the era, and. Um, between its aircraft and a couple of escort ships, it, I would actually give it a reasonable chance taking on something like, say, a Konigsberg class or even a Leander or an Arethusa class. I mean, yeah, it would be a bit the underdog, but it's certainly not out of its uh, range of firepower, as opposed to, yeah, a seaplane carrier or an aircraft carrier, which would need some kind of very heavy escort group to avoid going the way of glorious in the, as soon as any kind of actual war broke out the flip side obviously the argument being well could they have just made a standard light cruiser well yes they could but again what is one light cruiser going to do when the enemy any enemy that you're realistically going to be facing in sweden is going to have multiple it's much better to have the ship as a relatively able to defend itself scouting cruiser because remember, this ship is not the main firepower of the Swedish fleet. That that would be the Sveria class. Um, so, as a scouting vessel, it, I'd say it's pretty much fine. Maybe it's a little bit slow, but again, uh, operational constraints of what the Swedes could afford. Um, so yeah, for, for the role that the Swedish Navy needed it to be in, I don't see that many problems with the Gotland. Um, and I think in this particular case, um, Mr. Preston has fallen into the trap of analysing it from the point of view of a first-rate navy like the US Navy or the Royal Navy, which, as I said, yes, it would have been a terrible design, but it wasn't designed for those navies, so it's not. <laughs> 
And the next entry is the, you know, I, I, I did three years of French. Believe me, I did. Duquen? Duquesne? 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 Oh, whatever. These things. <laughs> the first French heavy cruisers. Um, yeah, someone from France tell me how the heck that's pronounced. I, I, there's a reason I only got a B in high school French. Anyway, um, these French heavy cruisers are included largely on the basis, well, in his own words, they're not suitable to fight anybody. And yes, he acknowledges in in his art in the article that in the book that nobody was really able to produce a satisfactory heavy cruiser on 10,000 tons once you had to start taking into account the advances in technology and the air threat. And yes, that's a fair comment. Um, and compromises had to be found in different places. Obviously, in some nations, not looking at you, Japan or Germany, their solution was simply to lie and make the ships bigger. Um, and in a couple of cases, still somehow fail, but never mind. Um, but anyway, the, the, the French, as with their large destroyers, they seem to have an obsession with going very, very fast. Um, albeit that the sort of 35 to 37 knots theoretically achieved on test were never actually achieved in real life, which suggests there was some creative massaging of figures and uh, special weighting of the ship to, to, to reach that uh, top speed on the test run. Um but yeah, in terms of compromise, obviously you've got that, the old uh, triangle speed, firepower, and protection. And the French really, really maxed out on the speed, and they held solid on the firepower with uh, eight eight-inch guns in four twin turrets. And uh, yet, yeah, the, the completely stuffed up the protection. I mean, this is a... You've got belt, and... You've got, say, the approach taken by the county class where they decide an adequate belt protection against uh, similar firepower isn't good enough, so they're going to, or they can't be done, so you're going to put it in a thicker box. Okay, fine. There's certain arguments for and against the box armor as opposed to the belt armor approach for treaty era heavy cruisers. But when your box is 30 millimeters thick, that's just over an inch. I'm sorry. A destroyer with ambitions can punch through that. You're seriously telling me, France, that you built a 10,000 ton heavy cruiser that could be quite easily beaten up by a tribal class destroyer, or a Fletcher, or a Narvik, or a Fabuki, or pretty much anything with a gun calibre of four inches or more. And of course, the hilarious thing is that the other end of this design tree of French cru heavy cruisers, on exactly the same displacement comes the Algerie, which arguably is a very strong contender for one of the best treaty era heavy cruisers. And yeah, this one, this one, I perfectly agree with him. This deserves to be on a list of world's worst warships. Um, is is basically a free ten thousand ton kill for the enemy. Next up are the Deutschland class Panzerschiff, or pocket battleship, or heavy cruiser, whatever you want to call it. Now, hmm, the inclusion of these ones is an interesting one. In terms of the doctrine they're designed for, that that much is definitely a failure. Um, to be honest, World War One should have told everyone, and World War Two, and the fate of uh, Admiral Graf Spee, actually, ironically, in both wars, uh, both the person and the ship, kind of emphasised and re-emphasised the lesson that no, you cannot successfully commerce raid with surface warships in a in the Dreadnought era when you are the underdog navy. So the entire sort of concept around which these ships were designed and built was a failure from the start. And if again, if this was world's worst um, naval strategies, then yeah, as an exemplar of that, these would deserve to be there. As far as ships themselves go, um, I'm not so sure. I mean, they're certainly not the best example of a uh, treaty era heavy cruiser, and there's probably at least three or four designs of treaty era 10,000 ton heavy cruiser that I would say were perfectly capable of matching or beating a Deutschland in a fight. And of course, you have Lutzau's. Which you renamed Deutschlands, 
uh, terrible showing at the Battle of Barents Sea, where literally with a line of sitting ducks it can't actually hit anything. The flip side to that is you do have Admiral Scheer uh, actually when it was allowed out, actually tended to do relatively well for itself. Um, the fact that it took quite a while to take down a single arm merchant cruiser can't be held against it too much, considering the two much bigger and more heavily armed Chan horse had a similar experience. Um, so yes, they are expensive, they're overgunned, they don't have particularly brilliant protection, and their speed is nothing to write home about. But... They're still a threat. They're still a serious threat to any cruiser, light cruiser, etc. Um, and outside of that, I, well, yeah, I can't see why they should be on the world's worst warships in and of themselves. I mean, they're, they're still, I say, they're still pretty dangerous. If if Lutzow had been properly commanded at the Battle of Barents Sea, then it could have done some serious damage and uh, possibly turned the tide of battle. I'm perfectly happy to give that. Um, so yeah, not not entirely sure why they're on there, except obviously uh, possibly bringing in the uh, the actual concept they're designed around. And now we're looking at the Condottieri class light cruisers of the Italian Navy. These are an interesting one, really, because. They're kind of the ultimate response to the large French destroyers, and they were designed to kill them. So the fact that they're quite small, um, quite quick, and, well, their armour protection is no. Um, yeah, you can kind of forgive them for that, if that's what they're actually used for. Practically, however, they were not. And to be perfectly honest, if the French uh, super large destroyers had actually had guns that were worthy of actually being installed on a warship. I don't think they would have done particularly well in that role anyway, but as it is, in the roles that they were used, well, unsurprisingly, as with uh, a lot of French and Italian designs in the interwar period, it proved that they had gone way, 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 way too far off the board of speed. They were not particularly uh, strong, very lightly built. Um, they needed to be uh, they needed work, kind of like actually like uh, Glorious, Courageous and uh, Furious, they needed work to actually make them survivable, to stop them twisting themselves apart in the sea. And uh, whilst the armament of eight six-inch guns puts them at the lower end of things, uh, the fact that they had no armour, basically as far as anything, as far as anything's really concerned, they just, they, they were not that good. Um, I mean... HMAS Sydney's Leander class, they were kind of the, the lowest end, well, apart from the uh, minor attempt at the Aerith users, but generally they were the lowest end of light cruisers that the Royal Navy had, and when the Sydney came across one of them, the cap, well, both two of them actually, the captain's uh, relatively um, sane response was, run the heck away. That's two of these things, versus, well, pretty much the lightest British cruiser you're likely to come across. Um, and yeah, and they ran away, and they weren't even able to do that properly, um, with one of them being destroyed. So yeah, Condottieri class, I'm I'm going to side, go, side come down on the side of, yes, I think these are justifiably included on a, a list of world's worst warships. They, they, um, they did not do anything much successfully apart from lay mines, and if you're going to do that, you might as well use a mine layer. Now we come to a ship where, honestly, I can't make a decision one way or another whether this should be on the list. This is the Japanese carrier Ryujo. Um, Ryujo? Mm, uh, I, I know there's at least one person who speaks Japanese who's in contact with me on the Discord. He'll pick me up on that anyway. Um, this ship is listed by uh, Anthony Preston, largely on the grounds of the many, many problems she had after she was built. Um, as, well, as with many Japanese ships of the early 1930s, she was far too lightly built, there were all sorts of design problems, um, especially with top weight and stability, and she required a couple of major dock 
dockings with uh, significant refits to fix all that. And yes, she wasn't anywhere near as capable as a bunch of the other Japanese carriers, Akagi, Kaga, etc., etc., which shouldn't be much of a surprise considering it's a 10,000 ton uh, light carrier, not a, not a sort of a full scale uh, fleet carrier. So, yeah, on the one hand, she was badly designed and she did have a lot of serious flaws, but once they were rectified, there is still the fact that although she has the inherent weaknesses of a lot of Japanese carriers, which would eventually show in her loss of, um, well, boom, um, she's still a 10, 000, just over 10,000 ton carrier, capable of 29 knots, and somehow they managed to get 48 aircraft in there. That's actually a pretty impressive feat, to be honest. Um, when you look at the various light and escort carriers produced by the Allies during the war, when you look in that same kind of... Uh, weight range you've got the bogue class and the bogue class are 11 knots slower and carry about half the air air complement at best and then you've got the independence class and they're about a thousand five hundred two thousand tons heavier they've got the same kind of speed but there's still only three quarters if and possibly less of the air complement so the Rougeau's not a terrible design in that respect. Um, ja I say, Japanese aircraft carriers had, were terribly designed in certain respects in terms of just being floating avgas bombs when they got hit. But I can't hold that against this ship in particular. That's a systemic failing within Japan, uh, or the Japanese Navy at the time. And given that the ship was designed significantly earlier than the Independence class of started construction in the early 1930s, I yeah I say I can't really decide. Um, in as much as the final product, once they'd fi fixed all the issues, was actually relatively impressive, albeit not what the Japanese Navy actually wanted. Um, but on the other hand, as actually built, she she was pretty terrible, um, but fixable. And given that some of the ships we've seen in this video and in the last week's video weren't even fixable, um, then I'm going to call pass on this one. See what you guys think. Next on the list are the Megami-class cruisers of the Imperial Japanese Navy. Now, with these ones, a lot of the same arguments we just had with the Ryujo could be leveled against these ships. They were built far too heavy and uh, far too top-heavy, particularly for their weight. They were lightly built, they had serious problems, they needed a lot of work to rectify their issues. And, well, they weren't carrying aircraft, so they didn't have avgas, but they did have that wonderful habit of carrying oxygen-rich torpedoes around, which were proved to be something of a liability when they started getting hit, albeit that the Long Lance, as we've mentioned before, was a very capable torpedo, and so launching them would be a doubly good idea, both because they're a very capable long-range weapon, and it also means you get the oxygen bomb off your deck. It was always a good thing. Um, but, unlike Ruggio, I'm going to fairly definitively come down on the side of saying these do not belong on the list of world's worst warships. Yes, again, like Ruggio, they had an awful lot of problems when they started, but they were reconstructed, again, fixable, um, so not that terrible. Um, and then when you look at their war record, well, they're Japanese cruisers, which means inevitably somebody, most probably a US submariner or uh, a pilot, is going to end up getting a kill marker for them. Um, but whilst they did remain afloat, they didn't do too badly. Um, I mean, they took out Houston and Perth, well, along with other units of the Japanese fleet, um, at the Battle of the Java Sea. Um, you've also got uh, Kamano and Suzoya. They fought fairly successfully, damaging and destroying various Allied warships. And uh, Megami lasts almost to the end of the war, which uh, <laughs> they, 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 I mean, yeah, all Japanese cruisers ended up sunk, but these ones actually lasted relatively a relatively long time, and 
would actually do some relatively decent damage. So I don't think they deserve to be on the list um, when taken as an entire body of, of their career. Yes, at the start, they probably would deserve that that moniker but as as a, as a whole uh, unit as a, a wartime service and everything no they then they're not the worst that you can certainly point to worst worst cruiser designs um of that period and now continuing this trend of uh shall we say denigrating the japanese navy the yamato class uh, who couldn't see that one coming Again, well, actually, unlike the other two, I'm pretty definitive on this. Yamato Mus and Musashi do not deserve to be on this list. Shinano, yes. <laughs> Shinano as possibly world's worst ever aircraft carrier by uh, on sort of terribleness per displacement. Yes, that belongs on the list. But the category is for battleships now as we know yes the yamato class were not perhaps the wisest of designs and yes they had significant flaws in their construction um, compared to best practice but at the end of the day they are still over seventy thousand tons of very very angry japanese battleship with some pretty nasty guns and well at the Battle of Samar, Yamato proved to be pretty much the only Japanese battleship capable of hitting all that much. Um, and they did take an awful lot of punishment to be put down. I mean, losing a fight against the mid to late war United States Navy is not exactly that much of a mark against, because show me anybody who wouldn't be in that position, with possibly the exception of if you just lined up, I don't know, the 1942-43 US and... Uh, royal navies and had them had to go at each other in the middle of the atlantic but outside of that i mean there there were aircraft from more carriers coming at these ships than pretty much any single navy's entire pre-war carrier fleet so the fact that they ended up getting horribly murdered by those uh, air attacks is not not a major mark against to say yes they had design flaws but in the end they were still very scary combatants. If if we're looking at world's worst warships and we're going to put a big battleship on the list, then it should be a battleship that if you put it up against Iowa, Bismarck, King George V, or Vittorio Veneto, you could say definitively, yeah, that thing's going to lose. Um, if you put any of those up against the Yamato, um, with the possible exception of Iowa, actually, and actually, no, even then... Out, well, in good weather, let's say, because obviously radar has its own is its own thing. But as as a pure battleship, put them in good weather, and uh, um, yeah, uh, my yen is on the Yamato there, so not the best they could have been, but definitely not the world's worst, and and also kind of the only super battleship. So I guess they can be best and worst super mega battleship at the same time, since unfortunately the Montanas were not complete. And now we come on to the Bismarck class. And yeah, possibly uh, yet another semi-obvious inclusion. Um, but despite the fact that I do rag on at length, and with a fair amount of justification, I think, about Bismarck's design flaws, again, this entry feels to me more like it's to do with the inherent problems with the, the Kriegsmarine in World War II, the Kriegsmarine, it wasn't a big, a big navy, it had no business trying to fight the Royal Navy, and no matter what it did in building battleships, it was never going to win that fight. Um, so, yeah. Bismarck and Tirpitz, yeah, you can argue they probably, they may not have been worth the resources devoted to them in terms of ships they killed, although in the Tirpitz video and in a couple of dry dock or two I have pointed out that in terms of overall resources expended, they probably forced the Allies to expend a heck of a lot more resources on them than they cost to build. Um, so there is that. And of course Bismarck did sink Hood. Um, on the other hand, they did have a bunch of 
fairly major design flaws, which again I have covered and will cover in the future, so I won't go into those in too much detail at the moment. And yeah, they they were designed... This is the thing, at the same time, yes, they had these design flaws, but again, you have to take into context the fact they were designed by a country whose battleship design industry had basically been stopped at the First World War and had a huge gap in in its continuity, and that resulted in a massive regression and loss of knowledge for design. So, again, yes, if you evaluate it on a ton-per-ton -ton basis against something like a South Dakota or a King George V, yes, and then you can make an argument that efficiency-wise, uh, on a per-ton basis, Bismarck is probably actually a pretty terrible warship. Um, but wars are not won by dividing everything into neat one-ton blocks and rating them by efficiency. They are they are won by actually sinking things. And, well, yeah, okay, fair enough, both Bismarcks did get sunk, but they took another capital ship down with them, which isn't terrible for Axis warships. Um, certainly better than any of the Japanese battleships managed, um, including Yamato. So... Yeah, the, the the problem with these big battleships, to be honest, like Yamato and Bismarck, is that by making them so big in an era where you've got treaty and pre-treaty era battleships almost entirely with the sole... Actually, even I was technically an escalation era treaty battleship, um, is that they are so big that a lot of their design flaws are masked by their sheer size and the fact that, if, let's say, efficiency-wise, they not may not be brilliant, but their their sheer displacement means that they can still fight much smaller battleships on an even footing, which actually sounds pretty terrible when you say it, but when the enemy only has those smaller battleships... Yeah. Um, yeah. With this class, I am... They're, they're pretty terrible, objectively, as battleships viewed on their own. Um, but they were still pretty lethal. And as I said, with like with Yamato, you'd expect if you're going to put it on, I think that's the thing. What it comes down to to me is if you're talking about world's worst warships and you're going to put a battleship up there, then if you put it up against its contemporaries or one step down, you should expect it to lose. And if you put it up solo against its contemporaries, so King George V, North Carolina, um. Well, there wasn't really a contemporary in the Japanese. Uh, maybe the Latorios. You wouldn't necessarily expect it to go down easily. You might expect it. You might expect it against a lose against some of those, but you wouldn't expect it to go down easily. So, mm, I'm torn on that one. Actually, I started off this segment thinking actually I'm I'm going to say it shouldn't doesn't deserve to be on that list, but maybe it does. I don't know. I certainly think the Scharnhorsts, if they had been stuck on here, would be a definite no. They don't deserve to be on here. The Bismarcks... Underachievers, I would say. Underachievers and, yeah, badly designed. Okay. From a purely engineering and objective standpoint, probably worth including on the list, but possibly take possibly also worth taking off the list if you look at, at what they accomplished during the war. So yeah, take that as you will. The next entry I really had to look sideways at because it's the implacable class of aircraft carriers and I was thinking, hang on a minute, <laughs> if you're going to go off on a polemic about British armoured carrier design, the indefatigables, which were the biggest and most capable of the British armoured carriers, are probably not the ones you want to pick. Um, but going through it, it 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 seems like the polemic's more aimed at the lack of fleet air on aircraft of a suitable nature comparable to US and Japanese aircraft, which to be fair, is a reasonable point to make when you're talking about things like the former, the fly, Firefly, the Skewer, the Rock, etc. Uh, the Albacore, flipping egg, that, if there was ever an aircraft that deserved a moniker of world's worst aircraft, the Albacore is certainly up there. Um, then you have, the, of course, the hilariously obsolete Swordfish that on paper is so fractally terrible that it seems to duck under all the horrible fates that could possibly be thrown at it with 
perhaps the exception of the channel dash, and ends up sort of coming all the way back around the universe again to actually turn out to be a fairly brilliant aircraft because it's it's so out of context for everybody else. But there you go. Um, yeah, the yeah, I don't. I definitely don't include with the, with these ships inclu inclusion on this list. Um, the armored carrier concept we've discussed in a separate video of the armored carriers versus uh, the American uh, unarmored flight deck carriers. And that's a whole other discussion. Go and watch that video. Link somewhere above um, at some point, possibly at the beginning of this section. Section, um, but yeah, I can agree with a certain amount of polemic against the fleet air air arms um, total lineup of aircraft for the first half of the war. Um, albeit that with a mixture of um, new aircraft coming online and some rather welcome assistance from the U.S in the form of Avengers and Hellcats, that was overcome. So, yeah, I mean, obviously they had design... They did have longevity issues with their low hangar heights. That much, has, again, has been covered before. But world's worst warships? No, the Indefatigable class... Indefatigable and Implacable do not belong on this list. Not by a... Not by a country mile. I have, I have no real idea why in a list of world's worst warships... This is on here. We're now almost leaving World War II behind as there's a general entry for hydrogen peroxide powered submarines of the German, US, Royal and Soviet navies. Now this one... Specifying the hydrogen peroxide power, this one I can actually agree on. Um, you can understand to a degree why the Germans went down this route because they desperately needed faster and uh, faster u-boats that could stay underwater for longer and in that much yes they succeeded however um as the article points out if you're going to use hydrogen peroxide as fuel you're talking about a substance that is self-fueling does not require external oxygen to burn it will quite happily eat its way through such uh, useful part things as cloth flesh bone and practically anything else that gets in its way and it needs just the tiniest little bit of rust or any other kind of inducing agent to get in contact with it and I would humbly suggest that putting something made of steel in the middle of an ocean full of salt water you're probably going to end up with rust sooner or later and when your primary power source could potentially just go up in an apocalyptic ball of flame by the mere introduction of such a thing. Yeah, this this was not thought through. Um, ultimately, we know hydrogen peroxide powered submarines were something of a dead end. Um, there's a reason the two that the uh, Royal Navy built when colloquially known as the Exploder and the Excruciator um, and described by an officer as not for the faint-hearted. When is the Royal Navy saying, mm, this ship's probably not for the faint-hearted? He's like, mm, okay, how many miles away do I have to run? Um, yeah. Uh, and there's actually more recently the dangers of hydrogen peroxide probably exemplified by the loss of the Russian submarine Kursk. So... Yes, I can agree. These probably do, do belong on the category of world's worst warships. Yes, they're an experiment, but they're a complete experimental dead end, and ex an experimental dead end that quite often ended with boom. Now, we come to, uh, well, another class of submarine. This now we're now leaving World War One quite firm, oh, World War Two even quite firmly behind, with the Alpha class nuclear attack submarines. Now, with these ones. To be perfectly honest, I'm not entirely sure what to make of them, and I've known about them for quite a while, and I still don't quite know what to make of them. I mean, you're talking about tiny little, effectively, tiny little high-speed titanium attack boats that are the closest underwater equivalent of, a, like, a fighter craft, effectively. Um, yeah, they're just utterly bizarre and weird and completely off the rocker of normal submarine design but they do i mean they have some things going for them they're they're damned fast for an underwater for a submarine their titanium hull makes them incredibly strong and able to dive incredibly deep um 
albeit it means you might as well build a submarine out of gold for the amount of money you end up spending on the blasted thing, albeit a gold submarine probably wouldn't uh, be able to dive quite as deep as a titanium hold one. Um, even the Soviets dash Russians eventually obviously admitted that it's probably kind of a dead end trying to make this kind of very loud, very fast interceptor type submarine because, well, it turns out when the British can just churn out a spearfish that can do 80 knots, it's like, well, good, so long, good night for that. Um, so, yeah, I think the main problem with these is that they're so far off the off the deep end, literally, of normal warship development that well, they've got nothing to compare them to, to see whether you could do it better or worse. Um, the liquid metal reactor probably didn't help that that much. So, yeah, there's an awful lot of design flaws in this, and there's an awful lot of design failures. Um, and they cost an absolute fortune. So, you can see, one, those grounds why they might be included in a list of world's worst warships. But on the other hand, they do have a few redeeming factors like as i say the incredible dive depth and the incredible top speed which when we're looking at some of the other um experimental dead ends that have been cited in this book and elsewhere that exist in the annals of naval history some of those experimental dead ends don't even have any redeeming qualities they're just bad period um so does the alpha class deserve to be on the worst mm. No, I don't think so. Um, I mean, apart from anything else, the advances in titanium manufacture and processing that were needed to be developed as a result of them greatly helped a, a large number of uh, future designs, both in Russia and um, in the Western world. So uh, there's that as well. So, yeah, I mean, um, that's not to say the Alphas are a particularly good design. They've got far too many problems to ever be listed at the top of any list of world's best warships, but I don't think they deserve to be on a list of world's worst either. Um, if you want to pick a Soviet submarine class to go on a list of world's worst warships, there are far better candidates. Next we have the Type 21 frigates um, of the Royal Navy. Now, yes, these de ships had definite flaws. They were far too... They, again, were far too lightly built. Um, they had fairly short service lives, and... To be honest, they are a classic example of almost going back to the bad old days of HMS Captain, where the job of the Royal Navy's design department was effectively subverted by a good propaganda campaign, in this case by commercial shipyards. And so you ended up with warships that were built more closely to, um, <laughs> well, they are built more closely to uh, commercial ship standards than warship standards, and it did show albeit that their, the losses that the class suffered in the Falklands weren't particularly anything to do with um, subpar quality of design. Um, the simple fact is the, the ones that were hit, they were, well, any, any kind of three to three and a half thousand ton small escort wasn't really going to survive that. Um, so, yeah, that, the fact that they were poorly designed in the first place means that yeah they're not they're not brilliant but at the same time they i can i can just about again i can just about if you're talking about modern modern frigates you can just about get them in maybe at the very top end of a list of world's worst warships but i think it's a uh it's a bit of a disservice to them and the service that they provided to to put them in a list where you're trying to say these are solidly the world's worst warships um they're definitely not good. Um, they're, they're definitely not um, anywhere close to what the Royal Navy needed or wanted, but they're not absolutely terrible. They're just bad. And the last entry on this list um, is perhaps the most confusing to me, actually. It's the La Combattante uh, fast attack craft of, well... Of many navies, but manufactured originally by the French and then sold on to the German, uh, Greek, Iranian, Israeli, Malaysian, and Libyan navies, and then um, subsequently in modified form sold to some of those navies, as well as the Tunisian, Qatari, South African, and Nigerian navies. And I thought, well, the history of the ships is fairly interesting, and you can see why they were built as uh, one of the various Western responses to the rise of Soviet um, 
fast attack craft, and then I'll sort of scroll down, okay, that's very nice, now let's go to the conclusion, why do you think they're so terrible? And the conclusion is basically a rant about small fast attack craft in general going all the way back to the torpedo boat of the 1800s, which doesn't really help any argument about a latter part of the Cold War, sort of 1960s, 1970s missile arm fast attack craft. Um, so, yeah, right at the end he talks about the fact that the, the fast attack craft generally are vulnerable to air assault at, because they can't really defend themselves that well and uh, to a certain degree also against um, larger warships now that uh, warship technology has advanced. Well, yeah, no kidding, of course small ships like this are going to be vulnerable to air assault. This, <laughs> the whole point of a fast attack ship is in part that they're small enough for you to be able to afford to lose them. Um, I can't really see any justification from either for saying that fast attack craft are completely... Um, completely uh, had their day, or indeed that these ones are any particularly bad example of it. Um, if you're looking at general fast attack craft, I can certainly point to a few that were, that are either actually worse than the La Combattants, um, objectively, and others that were kind of a bit of dead technological dead ends, even if they in them of themselves weren't particularly terrible. Um, so yeah, why are these on there? Um, if you're gonna if you're gonna put them on, at least make a coherent argument as to why that particular ship deserves the title. And in this case, there isn't much of one, so therefore, by default, it can't really be seen as eligible. I think. And so that brings us to the end of this review of the world's worst warship, something that I have been constantly badgered for for quite a while, and finally someone on Patreon decided to force me to do it via but vote. Um, overall, in the book as a whole, I would say the statistics for the various ships and the, the um, sort of potted histories of each of the various ship designs are quite interesting. Um, so it may definitely be worth a read from that perspective. In terms of the conclusions, well, I've outlined the conclusions as best I can and where I agree and disagree with them, so take that as you will. Um, obviously, I can't particularly uh, dictate to people one way or the other since, obviously, anti Russian is a prospective naval historian, um, so I can't just turn and say, oh, he doesn't know what he's talking about. And, well, the fact is, as you've heard over the course of the, these two videos, there are a number of places where I completely agree with him, and I think any reasonable naval historian would. But there's also a lot where I flat out don't agree. There's ones where I can see his point, but I think the moniker of world's worst warship is probably a bit unfair. Um, and, yeah, I think a lot of the time the problems that he is identifying are more to do with aspects other than the warship itself so things like the fleet tactics the overall outlook of the uh country the country's economic capabilities etc etc and these things yes you have to consider them in a whole and they can influence the kind of ships that are built and ultimately their fates i mean if you're the, almost anything built by the Imperial Japanese Navy pre-World War II looks like a terrible warship when you look at the casualty figures, but as I said, well, they were fighting the two largest fleets on the planet. What exactly do you expect to happen? Um, so, yeah, those decisions and the design philosophies, etc., and even some of the technologies can definitely come in for criticism, but I don't think it's necessarily fair all the time to to haul in the ships themselves into that category um as a review of terrible ideas and practices etc then yeah this list with one or two exceptions is probably a fairly good one but in terms of i say in terms of generating a list of the world's worst warships no this in that respect i think this book has probably failed there's there's a number that definitely don't deserve to be on there, and there's quite a few <laughs> that I could list that definitely deserve to be on there that, for some reason, aren't. Um, the easiest low-hanging fruit to pick there would be this Swedish ship Vasa. Um, 
I mean that that's kind of the the absolute low bar for um, for for worst warships. The ship that does not survive, not even doesn't survive its maiden voyage, doesn't even actually make it out of harbor on its maiden voyage. Now that that would be a, a world's worst warship. Um, so yeah, that's what I think. Um, hopefully you have enjoyed this uh, slightly different approach. Uh, to Wednesday specials, and we shall be back in another day with more naval history topics for your delectation and delight. Thank you very much for watching. That's it for this video. Thanks for watching. If you have a comment or suggestion for a ship to review, let us know in the comments below. Don't forget to comment on the pinned post for dry dock questions.